What's going on, everybody? Welcome to today's Seven Figures Club podcast. Today, we have an amazing entrepreneur and business owner who is serving other business owners and helping them to create their dream business. Her name is Penelope Jane Smith. She is the founder of Real Prosperity, Inc. Uh, she is the premier financial freedom mentor for women entrepreneurs and a go-to expert for some of the biggest names in the conscious business industry after losing her multi-million dollar real estate empire in the 08 crash, just like I did, by the way, Penelope became more passionate than ever about providing other women entrepreneurs with the financial education they never received in school and so they could avoid the painful mistakes that she had made together with her team at Real Prosperity Inc. She helps women entrepreneurs get a handle on their money figure out exactly what it will take for them to be financially free, very intentional, and chart a course to get there. She aims to inspire and support them to live life on their own terms and to make choices from a place of freedom and joy instead of debt, obligation, and fear. She's an acclaimed international speaker and certified trainer with over 20 years of teaching experience. She's the author of The Little Book of Prosperity, she has led live events with up to 200 attendees and shared the stage with other movers and shakers, such as Mark Victor Hansen, uh, Mark Victor Hansen's awesome, T. Harv Ecker, Alex Mandosian, Laura Langmeyer, she's awesome too, and uh, Ally Brown. Through her signature programs like Financial Freedom 101, Penelope has helped tens of thousands of entrepreneurs from all over the world to create more ease, peace, and freedom around money. So guys, if you like money, if you like prosperity, if you want to intentionally create that life that you want in your business, you're gonna to wanna to take notes and listen to Penelope Jane Smith. Penelope, welcome to the podcast. There are over 32 million businesses in the US and over 90% of them will never break seven figures in annual sales. So how do we as entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs break into that seven figures club? This podcast will relentlessly share the secrets, strategies, and tactics I've used to create three multi-seven figures businesses and bring in even more successful entrepreneurs than me to share their inspirational stories and tactics to success. You can create your dream business in life right now. So buckle up and let's go. Thank you so much, Leo. I love what you're doing here. You, you tackle so many exciting topics to support entrepreneurs. And I'm just thrilled to be geeking out about money with you. It's like my favorite thing in the world to do. So I know this is going to be awesome. Well, you're in the right uh, right studio because that's what we love to talk about here. Getting our money right, you know, creating the life and, and business that we want that, uh, you know, that, that creates our dreams, helping others, making a positive impact. But Penelope, we're always curious to find out the background of our guests and what led you to entrepreneurship? So two questions, you know, what, uh, who was Penelope in high school? What, what was she like? And what were some of the events that led you to want to become an entrepreneur and business owner? Well, I think even before high school, I was a very entrepreneurial child. I was always like doing these little projects, like selling cupcakes to my mom's friends or running a little poster contest for other kids in school. I had all these creative ideas. Um, I think by the time I got to high school and college, that had kind of gotten pounded out of me. <laughs> because Isn't that sad? It's super sad because by the time I graduated college, I'd been so like conditioned and programmed that I just had to like get good grades, get a good job, build my resume, go like commute to the city for the next 40 years. I, I seriously thought that was the only option, you know, and who was I in high school? I started off as like a pretty quiet, shy kid. You know, I would kind of like, when I was little, I'd hang out on the playground and like crochet and kind of not talk to the other kids. And then when I was 15, I volunteered at the Renaissance Fair. Do you have that where you live? I don't know. Tell us about the Renaissance Fair. So it's, it's this um, fair that is meant to kind of recreate Elizabethan England. And so, you know, women dress up in their bodices and skirts. Oh, okay. and I like that. And so you're kind of like in the realm of Queen Elizabeth. So they, have, they have actors playing Queen Elizabeth and Sir Walter Raleigh. And a little Jane Austen, if you will. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And so you, you go and you can have turkey legs and watch plays and, and it's fun. So the volunteers have these different guilds and I joined the town criers guild. And so we were the people who would ring bells in front of the parades going, make way, 
make way, make way for the queen, right? So like in that process, I mean, my, my job was to be loud and I had never been loud in my life. So I kind of found my voice and literally lot, found your voice. Yeah. And became a lot more extroverted. And so by senior year of high school, I was starting to kind of do some creative projects again. I started a club. I started my own literary magazine. I created these different like adventures for the other students where we'd all go have dim sum or, you know, it was just the, the creativity started coming back, but I still was conditioned in this employee mentality. And uh, after college, I got the opportunity to go live and work in Japan on the jet program. And I thought, okay, I'm going to have, you know, one more international adventure before the fun's over. <laughs> and when I was in Japan, I just happened to step into the bookstore in this, um, near the train station in Kisarazu in Chiba Prefecture. And they had a few books in English. And one of them was this purple book with gold lettering. And it said, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it just kind of popped out at me. And you've probably heard of this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Robert Kiyosaki. But back then, this is over 20 years ago, I'd never heard of that. And something about it just appealed to me. And I paid like imported Tokyo prices for this book, kind of surprised myself. I brought it home. And like, once I started reading it, I couldn't put it down. It's supposedly all about what rich people teach their kids that the poor and middle class don't. And it was like, it reawakened that entrepreneurial spirit from when I was a kid. And I learned about financial education and passive income. And I was like, why has nobody ever told me about this? Like, what the hell? Right. So that's asked about high school and kind of like what sparked the entrepreneurial journey. And, and that was it. I didn't even know you could be an entrepreneur until I read that book. And I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to learn how to invest and build businesses. And then I want to teach other people how as well, because if, you know, if I don't like this whole idea of like, go to some job for the next 40 years, I bet there's other people that don't like that either. A hundred percent. You know, I've got five kids. I'm trying to, you know, put them in a position to succeed. What is it about our education system that kind of takes the creativity or that, you know, drive to maybe create a, a product or service and just to kind of fall in line what is it our education system is, is missing? Because I think you have kind of created a lot of entrepreneurial education solutions to help business owners and entrepreneurs actually succeed. But what is the education missing? It, just a couple things that you think would really make a big difference that they're missing right now. Well, I think that our traditional educational system is really designed to train people to be employees right? It's like you, you punch in at a certain time, you punch out at a certain time. There's no financial education. Like I remember in school learning how to make change, right? That was like, you know, probably the most financial education I got. So it's like, what are they training me for? Clearly they're training me for a career in retail. Is that my only you option? Go to the cash register. Right? Like no one ever talked about entrepreneurship or running your own business. Like I never heard anything like that. It was all about grades, job, resume. That was all I heard. And so I think that what our traditional education system has been missing is first of all, financial education. And it's good to know that that's coming in more and more. Like some high school classes do actually have some personal finance classes now, which is good, but that, that wasn't the case. Um, when I was going through school. So I think they're missing financial education. And I think they're missing just talking about entrepreneurship that was like never mentioned when I was growing up in any of my career counseling in college and any of my high school classes, you know? So I think that uh, they should let people know that's a thing, right? Yeah. And maybe, you know, be really awesome is if they actually had business classes in school where kids could like create their own little business and like sell stuff to their classmates. I remember, going through uh, a personal development training where we met over a series of weeks and we each started off with a certain amount of points. And the idea was you wanted to have the most points by the end of the week and you could sell things to your classmates and you could buy things. So I decided I would sell coffee cake every week so people could depend they had that for breakfast. It sounds tasty. Night. Yep. And then that was back when I was eating flour and sugar. Don't do that anymore, but at yep, the time, <laughs> good idea. And uh, I, somebody sold a book, which I still have. Somebody sold me a journal, which I still have. So we created our own little economy with our own currency, which was these points over the weeks. 
And I think you could do something similar for sure in high school, maybe earlier. And I think that could be really fun to like have, you know, a, a business incubator. Absolutely. No, it's a beautiful idea. Each of those ideas would help the, just the talking about it. There is entrepreneurship. There is financial education. There's this thing called credit score that matters, right? There's there's getting your money right. There's understanding that you have to pay uh, taxes. There's tax returns, all these different strategies, but just not in the education system. You know, one thing I'm curious about that I find interesting is that you kind of went on this journey, you went to Japan. And so you left the country, you learned a different culture, maybe a different language. And I think there's something magical that happens when you do that. I, I lived in Chile for a couple of years and, and learned Spanish and, and that culture down in South America. What do you think about that experience? And, and you found a book there that, of course, is here in the U.S., but I mean, you're in Japan and you find this book. What do you think about that experience? Maybe um, put you in a certain situation to be, you know, looking for maybe different solutions or a different life. Well, I think anytime you travel, especially to another country, you know, the United States where I grew up is so big, you can go pretty far without ever leaving the country. Yeah. But some states even feel like culture shock. Oh yeah. Um, but when you go to, to Chile or Japan, or I also lived for a year in Madrid. Um, oh, very cool. It opens up your mind to that, you know, not everybody thinks the way that you do. Not everybody lives the way that you do. Like there are certain things we just take for granted. Like for example, okay, check this out. So where I live in California, we have a lot of Mexican food because we're close to Mexico. So yeah. we have great, you know, quesadillas and, you know, Mexican food is relatively inexpensive. So like you can go to the, can you can go to the store, can of refried beans is, I don't know, maybe a dollar. Like it's not much, right? So Mexican food is abundant, tasty, inexpensive. In Japan, it's like this exotic, expensive cuisine. Like you can't even find it. Uh, I finally found this one Mexican place and like what they served was like, nothing I would have <laughs> called Mexican in the past. It was like this blue tortilla thing with some meat. It was just like completely bizarre. And then we got this new supermarket in town that car carried a wider variety of things and they had refried beans, but it was like $5 for a can of refried beans. So just, I mean, even just little things like that, like, you know, just taking Mexican food for granted and then realizing, oh, that's not the case. You know, my students in Spain, because um, I stayed after my year abroad, I stayed there for another summer teaching English in a little town in La Mancha. They had never heard of peanut butter, you know? So it's just, it's just really interesting to see, like, you can, you can kind of learn more about your own culture when you get away from it. Oh, yeah. Right? You're like, oh, that's an American thing. I didn't, I didn't know that was an American I didn't know thing. the whole world didn't have peanut butter. Yeah, they didn't yeah, have it. I, didn't know, that's for I sure. didn't know fortune cookies were invented in San Francisco. It's not a Chinese thing, right? Like, <laughs> no, uh, amazing stuff. And there's so much eye-opening that happens when you're in a different country or a different uh, culture there. And I think what, what always surprises me is when you see immigrants who come and they immigrate to the United States and they just have this appreciation of the free market system, of our de democratic government, that they really have so much more freedom here. And not surprisingly, even though a lot of them don't speak English well, you'll see them start their own business and, and literally go and live that American dream. And I feel like that's something that we miss. miss. We don't understand how good the opportunity is here how awesome the freedom is and that free market to capitalism to be able to create financial freedom. And I know one of the things you're really good at and, and really help, you know, your clients focus on is defining financial freedom. How do you think people and especially business owners, entrepreneurs should define financial freedom, um, especially at the beginning of maybe a business? Well, I think financial freedom means different things to different people, right? And for some people, it's like making enough money to pay your bills and not have to rely on anybody else to be able to support yourself. For other people, it means not having any debt, having a big cash cushion, right? And all of those point to different milestones on what I call the path to prosperity. So there's actually a spectrum. And like at the beginning is becoming cash flow positive, having enough money come in that you can pay your bills and pay your lifestyle and keep your business going. Like there's freedom there, obviously, right? Not having a ton of consumer debt, there's freedom there having cash to pay for things or handle emergencies, there's freedom there. 
you know, starting to save and invest for the future. There's freedom there. Owning your house free and clear, if that's something you want to do, there's freedom there. All the way to like the eighth and final milestone is what I'm talking about, which is like the ultimate financial freedom. And that's where your passive income is more than your expenses. Your passive income being income that comes in, whether you're working, sleeping, or playing, like rental income from real estate or royalties from book sales, or even like income from a vending machine or ATM machine or laundromat or billboard that you own, like that money comes in regardless of what you're doing with your time. And when your passive income is more than your expenses, then you're completely at choice about what you do with your time. So you have more and more freedom as you move along and hit each milestone. And where I'm ultimately working to help people get to is that final milestone where your passive income is more than your expenses. That is a beautiful concept. Everybody listening, when your passive income, you know, exceeds your monthly expenses and you roll out of bed that, that first day of the month, it's coming tomorrow and you know, your bills are covered. That is a lot of financial freedom. And I think that's a big mis- misnomer. Some people think if I have X amount of dollars in the bank, that's financial freedom, but it's not. You can have money in the bank and that money will go and you'll, it won't replenish unless you have passive income. And, and that is amazing. We're definitely going to talk about some of the passive income strategies you use to teach people. One, one of the unique concepts that you've introduced is kind of having this, this money date. How does the money date work? And, and what is that uh, concept? And what should we be thinking about with that? So <clears throat> the process that I take people through, because I really specialize in supporting women entrepreneurs to become financially free in five, year, five years or less with $10,000 or more in passive income, right? And how we do that is through my wealth accelerator system, which has four parts, mindset, education, systems, and strategies. Uh, if you choose an acronym for that, it's MESS, MESS for short, because you know most of us are a hot mess when it comes to money. Like we never learned about this at school or nope. at home. And so the nice thing here is that your mess is the key to creating wealth. And you're always going to have a mess. You don't have to worry about cleaning it up and having everything all perfect together. But as you up-level your mess, you can create more and more and more wealth and freedom. And so one of those things, systems, one of my mottos is systems will set you free. And freedom is one of my highest values. So that's why I'm all about financial freedom. That's why I've become completely addicted to systems. And a system can help you take your natural human behavior and get better results. Because the the truth is that humans are not very good with money. You know, we haven't really like developed this skill set. We haven't really developed the intuition. Like for example, uh, we are hardwired for instant gratification and pleasure, right? To like seek pleasure, avoid pain. So it's very easy to just spend money, you know, and, and people tend to, as their income goes up, their expenses go up too. That's like the lifestyle inflation, right? That's that's normal human behavior. You know, bank balance accounting is normal human behavior. That's where you look in your bank account and if there's money in there, you go, oh good, I have money and you buy something. And if you don't, you're like, oh God, I gotta go get another client and <laughs> you go do some marketing, right? Um, but if you can put a system in place that works with those natural tendencies and try, instead of trying to overcome them, because you can try to overcome it, but to do that, you're relying on, on something called your willpower, which is very, very unreliable. If you look at a brain scan of this happening, your willpower gets fatigued from use, just like a muscle. You'll see a slowdown of activity in the anterior cingulate cortex of your brain, which is the brain area that's crucial to self-control. So trying to rely on your willpower to succeed with money just does not work out well. But if you can have a system, like for example, instead of having everything in one bank account, maybe you have a separate bank account for a specific purpose, right? That's a system that's gonna help you override that bank balance accounting tendency. And so I I lead a three-day event called Financial Freedom 101, where over the three days, we put all your money systems together to turn your business into a vehicle for creating wealth and financial freedom. And at the heart of all those systems, the one system, the keystone system that makes everything else go is your money date. It's like in Lord of the Rings, it's the one ring to rule them all. And so what the money date is, is the money date is that sacred space in your calendar where you actually pay attention to your money. So if you think about, yeah, if you think about like date night with your partner or spouse, right? You have that time to really focus on your relationship, give each other your full attention. 
So this is like that, but with your money, it's this sacred space because most of the time people are kind of like handling their finances randomly. They're like, you know, paying bills or putting money in their eye or doing their taxes kind of like whenever they get around to it, you know, it's all over the place. But if you had that, that space, maybe like an hour a week or an hour a month where, you know, you're totally focused on your money and just like with someone you're dating, you know, you have a relationship with money. And when I hear people say stuff like, I don't want, I don't want to look at my money. I don't want to deal with it. It makes me think like, gosh, if I told my four-year-old, I don't want to look at you. I don't want to deal with you. I just want to pay somebody else to like handle you for me. That is so gross. It's so gross to even think that, right? Or, or even say it. Like if you said that to somebody you were dating, how long would they stay dating you? Probably not very long, right? Oh, they're gone. Yeah, you don't care about it. Why but do, how, often, care? how often have you heard people say that about money? All the time. Even right. business owners are like, oh, I don't want to get into those deals. That's what, uh, that's what my accountant's for, right? And, and they're looking at it once a year and, and no wonder things aren't going the way they want it to go. Yeah, and you can totally get help, right? I have a bookkeeping team. I have a CPA. You know, I have a marketing director that like tracks my, my various stats weekly. But there's a difference between delegating and abdicating responsibility, right? And what I found is that when you pay attention to money, it's like you automatically have more of it. You, you want to be in a good relationship with it. It wants to stay with you, come into your life, grow for you. So I encourage you to like make your money date at least once a month. Have it be a sweet ritual. Start off with doing something that is nice. Like I like to light a candle just to make it feel like a sweet ritual. Some people get coffee or wine. Um, I have one client who is a, a sex and relationship coach. And she's like, if it's a date, I'm going to wear lingerie, you know, so she wears lingerie for her money dates. Um, but if you can, if you can just take that time, then all of your other systems, your investment strategy, your money management system, your profit plan in your business, that's the time when you can go set up and run all those other systems. So it makes everything work. And that's why the money date is so important. Penelope, I cannot believe how simple yet powerful this concept is. And I can think back to when I was struggling when I was failing as an entrepreneur, it was because I, I wasn't paying attention. I didn't have a money date. And a few years ago, I remember when, you know, a business I had started, it had done well. I brought in partners. They didn't share the same values and principles. We were losing money. I had to start over, build it on values and principles. But one of the big mistakes we made that I made as the leader in that business was we never knew if we were making money or not. We weren't paying attention to the books. And I said with our current business that we started uh, about four or five years ago, all right, we're going to look every single week, every Friday at the books. We're going to know where we're at. If their books are going to be up to date. We're going to know what our profitability is. Are we winning? Are we losing? Where are we spending money? And then for whatever reason, I decided every Sunday I was going to sit down, go through all of my personal finances and everything going there. What's my net worth looking like? What are cash flows looking like? What debts do I need to pay off? And when I did that, something magical happened, but I've never heard it coined as the money date. And this is so powerful, guys. If you don't have a money date set aside, and I think it needs to be every single week, it will absolutely change your life. What a wonderful concept. Go on a date with your money once a week. And if it's, it's the relationship, right? It's if you if your relationship with your children matters, it has to be in your calendar. If your relationship with your spouse matters, there's got to be a weekly date night. If you don't invest that time, you'll fail at that relationship. And that's why people have a bad relationship about money. They don't talk about money. It's this taboo subject. And that's not a good relationship. Amazing concept. Now, one question I, I have that I'm curious about, you know, what are some of the factors or obstacles you know, as a female entrepreneur, that, that if you're a woman listening right now and you're thinking of taking the plunge or you're starting a side hustle, what are some of the factors and things that you should be thinking about and taking into account before you, you know, make that, uh, that jump? So as a woman, what should you th be thinking about if you're starting a business? Yeah. Like, is there, what, what challenges are there that maybe they aren't considering? Obviously, you know, maybe you have some single moms that are looking to start a business and they've got a lot of 
things to juggle. And, and certainly that can happen in a lot of different ways. But I'm just wondering, as because that's your focus is you serve female entrepreneurs and we need more female entrepreneurs out there who need you know, support and have to understand the challenges they're going through. What, what should they be thinking about or you know, taking into account as they're growing their business or trying to launch one? Uh, that maybe yeah. they don't oftentimes think. About. I think you need to look at the fact that there's a difference between making money and growing money, right? And everybody needs to look at this, but this is going to come back to female entrepreneurs specifically also. Um, so the make money world, you know, you're creating value, you're getting clients, you're creating products, you're selling your services, and you're generating some income, right? And then the grow money world, you're getting that money working for you. So here you're working for money. In the grow money world, you're getting your money working for you. And I think especially as women entrepreneurs, it's really important to consider that grow money world sooner rather than later. And here's why. The vast majority of financial products and financial planning services and investment portfolios are designed for men by men. And there's there's this inherent gender bias in that industry, like in a lot of industries. Like, did you know that the average person that seat belts are safety tested against is based on the average man? So more women get injured by and die from seat belts than men do. It's it's pretty messed up. Some so there's something similar happens with heart medication. So there's a lot of industries where the average person is actually an average man and w- women are literally suffering and dying because of that inherent gender bias. And what happens in the financial planning industry specifically is that these models don't take into account women's longer lifespans. It doesn't take into account the differences in our career paths and financial goals. Like a lot of us do take time off to have a baby or care for an aging parent, you know? Um, And when you don't take those things into consideration, what happens is statistically women end up with less money at retirement, but it has to last us longer. So I see that as a big problem. And while I work with people of all gender identities, you know, men, women, non-binary, the reason I specifically focus on women is because I feel that we're massively underserved by the financial planning industry. And so as you're setting up your business from the beginning, I encourage you to be thinking about not just money now, not just making money, but how is this going to become a vehicle for creating wealth and freedom in the grow money world and start building that muscle of investing consistently over time, striking a balance between investing in your business and investing outside of your business to grow kind of like your own, your own golden goose. That's going to lay the golden eggs. Right. And then you can enjoy the golden eggs. Um, So I think that's really, really important to even in the beginning, start putting, you know, $5 a month, $10 a month, $25 a month, like whatever you can do. The habit of managing your money is more important than the amount. So start building that muscle from day one. Um, The other thing I would say is learn about cash flow planning, (laughs) do your money dates. And and that's going to really help. Like all those systems I was talking about, like creating abundant, consistent income in your business, but then also planning your cash flow, managing your money, having an investment strategy, all of things are going to work together because, you know, it's hard work having your own business. Like whatever you're doing is going to be hard. So you may as well have that work go towards building to the future rather than just on the constant hamster wheel. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and unpacking a little bit more about, you know, what, uh, how, how off kilter some of these systems can be that, uh, that aren't making sense. It reminds me of the story, story of Sarah Blakely, the founder of Spanx, and she's going into these different manufacturing, uh, places to get her, her Spanx product going, which is this, you know, awesome uh, fabric and, and clothing undergarment for women. And it's, it's men who are creating it for, and they're doing it all wrong because they don't understand, you know, the different uh, challenges that they have with these clothes and she does, and she does it. So it's just amazing. And so there's opportunities there where something that, uh, you know, is good for the average man, but aren't even thinking about what it should be. And that's the beauty of, I think, focusing on niches, right? The riches are in the niches and there's in finding that underserved community or uh, population segment, that's where you can create a lot of value. And I think you made that point incredibly. And you're right. The, the biggest issue is, is a lot of entrepreneurs is we're, we're not paid, we're, we're making money, we're building the business, but we're not 
thinking about growing the money and creating passive income, what are some of the strategies we should be looking at to grow our money and create passive income and cash flow? Well, you can create cash flow in your business and you'll, you can also create cash flow from your assets, right? Yeah. So I think that the, the key systems you want to put in place is, first of all, if you're going to be in business for yourself, it all starts with your profit plan. This is how you create consistent and abundant income in your business. And when I share it with you, it's going to sound like super freaking obvious, especially to you, Leo. You're going to be like, yeah, of course. However, I will say that anytime I'm talking to an entrepreneur that's not making the money they want to make, they're missing one or more of these steps or, or one or more of the steps is off. So the first, the first thing you need is um, your marketing system. This is how you create visibility and get potential clients to know you and get interested in your services. From your marketing system, you bring them into your sales system. This is where you actually say, hey, do you want to sign up for my thing? You know, and they become a paying client. And then, of course, the third part is you need an offer, right? And usually I begin with the end in mind and reverse engineer this with people. So we look at, okay, what is going to be a profitable offer for you? I work with a lot of like speakers, authors, coaches. So it's usually some kind of like VIP day or package or something like a premium offer. I would love for people to have a premium offer worth at least more than Nine ninety seven, so that you don't need to talk to as many people. But even if you're doing uh, a product, you know, like I have customers that sell custom tea blends. I have a client that um, sells jewelry. Like, how can you do bigger orders? Like I suggested that maybe my jewelry client creates like five thousand dollars statement pieces for people like me that like the boom bling, right? Um, or in the case of the custom tea blends, who could bulk order it? Like what, what stores might carry their tea or what restaurants might carry their tea, right? So think about like, how can you have a premium offer with a high ticket sale? And then what's the best sales or enrollment system to bring people into that? And what's the best marketing system to bring people into your sales system? Now, again, that makes a lot of sense, right? And yet, how many people have you seen out there, Leo, just practicing random acts of marketing? You know, I've seen people, unfortunately, pay, I think the majority, I've seen people buy $6,000 a month for Facebook ads and not offer them anything and wonder why they're not making money. I'm like, you're not selling anything. Like, how, how is this not totally obvious? Right? Like, ah, I've seen people have, you know, this beautiful like sales page all lined up and not driving traffic to it. And I'm like, okay, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills here. Like this seems really straightforward to me. So like, once you get those three parts, you know, working and clicking together, now you're able to create consistent and abundant income in your business, right? Because if you're always bringing people into that marketing system, into the sales system, into the premium offer, then you have a consistent flow of clients. And one of the things that contributes to the entrepreneurial income roller coaster is you go and you do a bunch of marketing and you get people and then you're like working with them and you stop doing your marketing. <laughs> Right. And then you're like, oh God, I need more clients. So you go do marketing again. Right. Whereas like, what if you just had, you know, a certain number of hours a week, you were like always doing your marketing stuff. Right. And a certain number of sales conversations or sales events. Like I do uh, three live events a year where I open enrollment for my program. And so it's just this, this consistent system of bringing people to the event, opening enrollment, serving those people as we're marketing the next event. Um, so that works really well. And then of course, once you have that coming in, you need to be able to manage that cash flow. So for me, having an event-based business, that means I make a ton of money like three times a year. And then I also have people on payment plans, which kind of fills in the gaps, right? But before I knew cash flow planning was a thing, this is embarrassing, but this is totally true. I would be like, I just made like 60 grand last weekend. Like how do I come? I don't have the money to pay for this bill. Like I just, I didn't, I didn't understand. And then I finally realized, oh, cash flow planning is a thing. Like looking at when the actual cash is coming in, when the actual cash is going out and planning for it. And so now I can see that in a spreadsheet very clearly. And I know what's coming in, what's going out. If I want to like pay 20 grand for a VIP day with somebody or sign up with a mastermind, I could be like, okay, where can I do this where it's not going to impact my cash flow. And I can see, oh, in five months, I'm going to be $5,000 short if I don't sell something rather than I'm $5,000 short this week. What happened? Does that make sense? 
it makes a lot of sense. So guys, first things first, if you're going to get your money right as a business owner, you've got to have marketing systems where if you focus on it, you put a dollar in, you're bringing $2 out, there has to be a sales system. You bring traffic to your website or to your offer, great. Now you actually have to have, to have that sales system, that offer, maybe you have a lower ticket offer, and then that leads into your higher ticket offer. And when you have that system consistently moving and working for you 24 hours a day, then that is going to create a lot of cash flow. And now you can actually you know, grow your business and grow your personal income. And now that leads us to you know, that next step. Okay, Penelope, now I'm getting my business right. I'm getting my money right. I have a marketing system, a sales system. I have a high ticket offer system as well. My fulfillment's good and I'm getting referrals. The business is growing. Now I've got this pot of money that I've never had before in my life. Like, what am I supposed to do with that? Well, I think even before you have the whole pot of money, you yeah. want to be managing whatever comes in. Because like, if you can manage the little bit of money, it almost like shows the universe that you can handle managing more of it, yes. right? So um, it's kind of a personal money management system. Yeah. So in your, in your cash flow planning, a cash flow plan is telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went, right? Yeah. It's, it's yeah. basically, you know, like a budget, except budget makes people feel like contracted, right? Whereas a cash flow plan, I think is more accurate because it's a plan for the cash that's flowing in and you've heard pay yourself first, right? Um, but again, if you're relying on your willpower, that's very hard to do. So if you create a system, a money management system, where in your cash flow plan, you're allocating to specific things. So in addition to paying your virtual assistant and your, you know, your CRM and your Zoom account and all these things, you put some allocations in there to like, okay, this much money is going to investing this much money is going yes. to savings you know and you create like separate accounts or separate buckets for those things and so when money comes in you transfer it to those separate accounts before you do anything else with it and then that way the money actually gets transferred from the make money world to the grow money world without getting spent on something else and then once you have it over here in the grow money world then of course the next step is to have an investment strategy where you're buying assets, getting that golden goose growing, getting it to give you golden eggs, right? So I don't know like how deep you want to dive into investments. Oh, no, that's really good. Let, let's just unpack that uh, real quick for the audience. So your money's coming in as a business owner, you've paid your business bills, and then you've got to have some sort of personal budget. Even if you have estimated, I need X amount for entertainment or to go out to eat for the month. So there's money that comes in for your personal budget or, you know, whatever your personal bills are and, and giving yourself some leeway there. But then all the extra does not go into that account. That goes into a separate account that you're going to proactively use to invest. And it's not money that you're touching and messing around with unless there's an emergency and it's going towards investments. Yeah. And I would even, I would even split it up. So yeah. the first thing I would do is make sure that it's not just the extra that you take some off the top before you even do business expenses, even if it's just $5, you know, because if we treat profit as an afterthought, we usually we don't have up, any, we usually don't end up with any, right? So there, there's even a whole book by Mike Michalowicz called Profit, profit First, first. which yeah. is all about take your profit first. And I, I was one of his very first uh, licensed Profit First professionals because I was like, this is what oh, I've been talking about for decades. Awesome. This is awesome, right? Um, and I, just, I stopped doing that because I couldn't handle <laughs> any more one-on-one -on -one clients. But um, yeah, the idea that like in your allocations, when you're allocating in your, ta in your cash flow plan, before you put money into your operating expenses account, you automatically have some going over for profit. And then of course, as you're managing your cash flow, if you end up with extra at the end of the month, you can you know, put more in. But I would definitely have some come in right off the top before anything else, even if it's just a small amount, even if it's like- non negotiable right? Or 25 bucks or whatever, just like automatically, boom, there you go. And then I would also, when you're doing your money management system, have an account that is your reserve account or contingency account, emergency fund. Like I, I prefer the term reserve account because I follow law of attraction and I don't want to like hmm. attract more emergencies, right? So I call it reserve account. And um, I want to make a distinction between your reserve account and your investment account. So your reserve account is like an insurance policy. It's there to protect your investments, make sure you don't get into a whole bunch of high interest rate debt if you don't want to. Um, it's like that cash cushion between you and life's unexpected, like, bah, you know, whereas your investment account, its job is to grow. That's, that's the golden goose. So I would actually be putting some money into both of those. The goal with the reserve account is get $1,000 in there as quickly as you can 
just so you have that little buffer. And then eventually it's nice to work towards having three to six months of expenses in there. And that can feel like a really big goal. So that's why I like the Dave, the Dave Ramsey method of just like get a thousand dollars in there as soon as possible. Yep. And then you can kind of like still put a little bit in, put in a little bit in. Um, but I personally would not wait to get the investment account started because the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Next best time is today. Like start now, 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 the sooner you can plant those money seeds, the sooner you can get yourself into that prosperity and wealth cycle, the sooner you can get that golden goose growing for you, the better you'll get compound interest on your side. And you'll also be building the habit and reinforcing your investor identity, right? Because once you start investing, then you're like, well, I'm an investor. Here I am investing. That must mean I'm an investor, right? So it reinforces that identity as well, which is really powerful. Outstanding. So many gold nuggets there and value bombs that she's dropping on you guys in terms of getting your money right, creating that cash flow, multiple accounts where the money is coming off the top. The profit first thing is huge. Like I said, in my previous business, uh, that was a massive mistake, uh, not kind of allocating, hey, this this is profit. And, and now you've got to actually tweak your business so that the profit is happening. If you don't make that conscious effort, and, and you don't know where you're at with your bookkeeping, you never make that happen. So that's that's huge. So Penelope, a lot of the audience are listening, saying, wow, how can I you know, live by some of these systems and create these programs to my business and my personal life to get my money right? What's the best way that they can connect with you and start to get their money right as a business owner and take advantage of this? Well, I would say the very best resource I can possibly offer you is to attend Financial Freedom 101 because okay. you just just carve out three days of your life so that you get the tools to become financially free forever. And we'll walk you step-by-step step through creating your whole entrepreneurial wealth blueprint, starting with your profit plan, your cash flow plan, your money dates, your money management system, your, you know, your investment strategy. Like you'll have all of that put together by the end of the three days. And then you'll have those systems for the rest of your life. So that's a really powerful event. And you, it's available on my website for $4.97, but I'm going to give you a special magic link. The special magic link is giftfrompenelope.com, giftfrompenelope.com. If you use that magic link, then you get to attend on full scholarship. So all we ask is that you put down a $97 deposit, which you get back after the event. So it really is a full scholarship. The reason we ask for the deposit is because we send you a workbook and materials in the mail. So we only want you to sign up if you are actually planning on attending. <laughs> um, so that is gift from Penelope.com. And I promise you will be amazed at how much fun we can have geeking out about money for three days. Awesome guys. Wow. That that's amazing. So that is a gift. What was the rest of it? Gift from Penelope.com. Okay. Gift from Penelope.com guys, gift from Penelope.com. That is not something she gives out to everybody. So that, that we really appreciate her sharing that uh, with you. So go to gift uh, for Penelope. Is that what, from no, gift. Penelope. Yeah. Say it again. Gift from Penelope. Gift from Penelope. There we go. It, uh, it went to the, the change the URL on me when I typed it in. So that's okay. Gift from Penelope.com guys. Gift from Penelope.com. Take advantage of that gift. And, and, and the biggest thing is, as we get to the end here, listen, there was a lot of value. There was a lot of lessons and it's hard to captivate it all, right? There's a lot of information and we're humans. So we need repetition. We need to keep diving into the details. And that's where, that's where it is. When you allocate the time and you set it aside, good things happen. So go to giftfrompenelope.com, go through that training, schedule out, okay, for the next Two days, I'm, I'm going to do it at this time or whatever time you can do it. Knock that training out and good things will happen. Because if you don't have a relationship with money, then money's not going to care about you. But when you have the right relationship and you attract it and you have the right mindset, that's all. All of those things are foundational that Penelope is going to really help you, you know, get, get your money right and get uh, your business right, and your cash flow right. So Penelope, the final word is, is yours. You know, what, what is the final thought that you want to leave with the audience? Um, and a lot of it probably is taking action. But Well, I saw this quote on Facebook. You know how sometimes people post those memes and quotes? Yeah. And it wasn't from a specific person, so I can't give them credit. It didn't have a name on it. 
but it completely stopped me in my tracks. And I was like, that, that is it. And it said, do something today that your future self will thank you for. Mm -hmm. Do something today that your future self will thank you for. And when I think about everything that my past self went through to give me the freedom and spaciousness that I have today, I want to cry. I mean, we're doing this interview right now and I'm in my gorgeous dream house. Like if I look up above my webcam, I'm looking at views of the Bay and the green Hills. And it's just like, I, I love my life. And I'm so, so grateful to my past self for everything she did to set me up for success here. So that is the main thing I would like to leave you with. Mm, beautiful. Do something today that your future self will thank you for. If you've listened to this podcast, your future self is definitely going to thank you. If you want your future self to be really happy with you, then go to giftfrompenelope.com and take advantage of the, of the you know, amazing scholarship training. Take action. You know, implement these concepts in your life. And we will see you next time on the Seven Figures Club podcast. Are you looking for more seven figure secrets, content, or even how you can launch your own recession proof business? Then check out sevenfigures.com. That's the digit seven, F I G U R E S.com, where we share more videos, stories, strategies, funding solutions, entrepreneurial education, and even the secret business type that's recession proof. Thank you for listening. And if you're finding value in our podcast, please give us a five star and invite others to join the club.